Good afternoon. We're so glad you can join us today for our webinar on Indigenous financial wellness. Uh, to start off, we have some quick logistics. Um, you may have noticed as audience members you have put on mute for the webinar. However, if you would like to ask a question of our panelists at any time, please use the question box at the right side of your screen and type in your question. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the session. We will also send you a copy of the slides from this webinar, as well as a link to a recording of the webinar within a few days. And finally, for those of you uh, on the World Wide Web at Twitter, we'll be live tweeting the webinar using hashtags Prosper Canada Web sorry, Prosper Webinar, and our Twitter handle is at ProsperCan if you would like to give us a follow. Um, my name is Natasha McKenna and I'm a program officer at Prosper Canada. We are honored to be hosting this session with you today and we're excited that we have over 200 individuals from communities, organizations, uh, financial services and uh, governments from coast to coast to coast to have joined us. Uh, Prosper Canada works with partners in all sectors to ensure that individuals living uh, in Canada, regardless of their income, have access to financial programs, products, services, and advice they need to build financial well-being. Many of you are our partners on the line today with us, and we're so happy that you're here and you bring first-hand experience with this work. Um, for our webinar today, our focus, as I said, is on Indigenous financial wellness, is why you've joined us, and our work is grounded in thinking around principles of reconciliation, and so one of those principles that we draw upon is from the a fifth principle from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, that reconciliation must create a more equitable and inclusive society by closing the gaps in social health and economic outcomes that exist between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Um, we're interested in breaking down barriers to financial inclusion and well-being, so we see working in partnership uh, with uh, Indigenous uh, organizations and communities as key to uh, success. I'm very excited to introduce our speakers today who will bring uh, insights on our work together. Uh, Simon Bracoupe, our partner at AFOA Canada, is the Vice President of Education and Training, and Liz Mulholland, our CEO at Prosper Canada. Um, they're going to share from our agenda today um, a number of uh, key items. So. <laughs> Thanks. We're just going to get back to the agenda slide in front of you here. So the goal of today's webinar is to introduce a framework for looking at Indigenous financial wellness. We're going to start with hearing from uh, first Simon Bracoupe at AFOA Canada and then uh, Liz Mulhund for a brief introduction to both of our organizations. Um, then Simon will share with us our framework for uh, looking at Indigenous financial wellness and then we'll review some of the key barriers and opportunities for building financial wellness in Indigenous communities and highlight best practice for, uh, and opportunities for building financial wellness. Uh, in particular, we're going to offer some considerations for implementation and delivery, as well as highlight a few resources for the field. Um, I should note we're using the term Indigenous today um, for some of, our, uh, some of the examples and work is drawn specifically in work within First Nations communities, and particularly communities in Ontario. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Simon Bracoupe, who is joining us on the line from Ottawa today. Kwe Kwe from Algonquin Territory in Ottawa. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you all um, over the internet. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, AFOA Canada. Uh, our vision is really um, a center of excellence, excellence uh, information, and certification in Aboriginal management and finance. Uh, we have a number of education programs, um, particularly the one we're talking about today, Indigenous Financial Literacy and Wellness. We run uh, community capacity building workshops uh, year round, and we have a couple of exciting certification programs for financial managers and administrators. And we also have a uh, Journal of Aboriginal Management. At this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Liz. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, my name is Liz Mulholland. I'm the CEO of Prosper Canada. Uh, for 
Some of you may be familiar with us, but for those who aren't, we are a national charity. We were founded in 1986, and our mission is expanding economic opportunity for Canadians who live in poverty through program and policy innovation. So really our role is Canada's national champion of financial empowerment. We work with government, business, and community partners to develop, test, and promote uh, financial policies, programs, products, and advice that help build financial well-being. Um, one of the key ways that we work is uh, finding service systems and organizations in all sectors that want to build uh, proven financial empowerment approaches into their businesses, uh, and we work with them to find ways to do this that are sustainable for their organizations, that help them achieve their organizational or business goals, and that also measurably increase the financial well-being of low-income people. And we're delighted to be working in partnership with AFOA Canada in our work with First Nations peoples. Thank you. Simon, we'll turn it over to you for the next section. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to start with a, a definition uh, of financial wellness um, from an Indigenous perspective. So we see it as a continuous process, like a, a flow of balancing income, saving, investing, and spending to achieve uh, uh, one's life goals. And when we look at uh, things holistically, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, it, we, we're looking at it as a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of our lives. And we're looking at over a life cycle uh, from uh, children, youth, adult to elders, and to maintain a state of wellness uh, for individuals, family, and community. So when we talk about individuals, we, we also have to talk about the family and the community um, in our communities. So the uh, next slide, um, we have a, um, a medicine wheel. And um, in the medicine wheel, I, I just talked about the individual, the center, uh, family, and then community. And <coughs> we'll start, <coughs> excuse me, we'll start from the, uh, the top. Um, financial education and counseling. And then we move to the right, access to benefits, which is uh, um, higher income, and we'll, and we'll address that again later. And financial inclusion, uh, affordable financial products and services, um, keeping in mind that a lot of the um, First Nations and Indigenous communities are uh, often in rural, remote, and isolated uh, areas of Canada, uh, so having access to banks and banking services um, and other services are a bit difficult. And then to the left, uh, saving and asset building, um, building that financial security. And I think at th this point, we're at a turning point in uh, Canadian history, uh, as Liz pointed out earlier uh, uh, about reconciliation. Uh, there are a number of things that are changing the um, environment for uh, Indigenous people, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So there's a lot of enabling uh, legislation and uh, governance. Uh, that is changing. The federal government uh, is looking at a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Uh, they just signed... Um, uh, MOUs with uh, Inuit, Métis, and First Nations. And um, so things are changing. Um, strong institutional assets. Uh, more First Nations are taking control over uh, things like education, health, uh, social services, fire. So um, with more control, it is uh, creating a excellent um, opportunities in First Nations communities uh, for employment and growth. Uh, cultural revitalization uh, for the last uh, three or four decades, uh, there's been a major cultural revitalization, uh, particularly in our young people uh, who are moving, going back to the culture, getting more interested in their language. And so this is a very exciting and essential aspect of the change. 
and then strong legal and political assets. And by that, we mean that uh, the Supreme Court of Canada um, uh, regularly support uh, Indigenous rights. Um, and so that uh, whole area is, um, is changing. So we're going to go over to the next slide um, where we're going to be talking about opportunities to build financial wellness. So part of the work we've been doing is we've been looking uh, at um, uh, the situation uh, in communities, but also looking at barriers and opportunities. So um, there's a lot of um, misinformation about uh, on reserve and urban. And um, so when we talk about on reserve, we're talking about uh, uh, income is not taxable on reserve, but I should point out um, uh, First Nations people pay a lot of tax. Um, low tax filing rates uh, and income tax preparation is a challenge. I think the uh, Canadian government last year came out with this um, point that ha half of the First, First Nations child tax benefit was not being um, uh, taken advantage of. Uh, they've since uh, changed that to... Um, you know, there's a significant uh, gap between uh, tax filing between Canadians and First Nations, but the uh, the amount of money that's not flowing into communities through child tax benefit could range from 300 million to half uh, half a billion dollars. It's a, it's significant. Uh, the very few banks um, on um, uh, First Nations communities. Uh, ID can be a barrier, uh, average income is low, and education and employment health indicates, indicators are significantly uh, below Canadian averages. Um, they're increasing, but uh, we have a, a bit to go. In the urban environment, um, income is taxed, uh, better access to income tax preparers, more access to banks, ID can still be a barrier. Average income is higher than on reserve, and education, employment, and health indicators are stronger than on reserve, but below Canadian averages. So we'll go to the next slide. So here we're looking at um, um, barriers and opportunities. So I, as I just pointed out, that um, we're estimating that 30, 40 percent of First Nations individuals are missing out on important income benefits because they don't tax file. And for example, 350 million in Canadian child tax benefit. So the barriers we've identified are unaware of benefits, um, worried they might owe CRA money, the complexity of the tax system and the forms, uh, English as a second language, a lot of times some communities, 93% of the community speaks Cree, for example, or Nefkatut. And so uh, people that speak um, their language, um, uh, the second language uh, is English or French. So there's some uh, challenges there. Uh, no secure compu computer access, uh, difficulty assembling paperwork. Uh, there's a mistrust of government. We'll talk about that again later and lack of confidence. So the opportunities uh, that um, um, AFOA and Prosper Canada has identified is expanding access to benefits is a federal government priority, uh, rising First Nations awareness and interest, more in the South, south addressing this issue with tax, tax preparation supports. And that's the, we've, we've found through our networking uh, Prosper Canada and AFOA collaborating to promote opportunity, but local capacity and access to nonprofit and government supports to help screen people for benefits and tax file or apply can be an issue. And this is the work. This is what we found in our work in Ontario. We are working with to pilot new approaches with the CRA volunteer program and others. And in fact. Um, um, I set one up here in Ottawa with the Adawa Friendship Center and um, worked through all the challenges. But in the end, it was uh, well worth it. So we'll go to the next slide. 
Uh, we're going to talk about expand access to banking services. So 20% of Indigenous peoples um, uh, don't know. Uh, it's going back and forth. Oh, okay. So we're wrong slide. So we have the the uh, we're we're on the building saving slide. Oh, okay. I'm on the wrong slide. Sorry. Twenty percent of Indigenous people don't know how uh, they will finance their retirement. This was a study done by AFOA a couple of years ago. Sixteen percent are counting on government assistance alone. So the barriers are few or no local financial institutions. Uh, many people are unbanked or underbanked. Uh, as the further north as you go, as we pointed out earlier, uh, very few banks. Uh, so they're relying on retail stores and even the First Nations themselves uh, to act as banks. Uh, low financial literacy, low income, uh, precarious volatile income makes it harder to save and uh, sharing um, prioritized over sa saving. So in a lot of the communities, uh, people are supporting each other, family members. Uh, so they're sharing their incomes um, and, um, and overlooking uh, their savings. So the opportunities are building emergency savings, a priority under uh, Canada's financial literacy strategy. So this is uh, an area that we take seriously. Financial education combined with apps and online tools can help people save. Smart Saver offers help with education savings. Innovative tax time savings interventions can help people turn tax refund into emergency or long-term savings. And we just found uh, in some communities, mothers were uh, taking their child tax benefit and putting it into their children's uh, uh, future uh, education. And as we all know, um, that creates an opportunity for the child to more likely uh, go to university uh, or college or, or do training. Okay, so we're now uh, to the next slide. Uh, expand access to banking services. So uh, when we talk about only four First Nations, we're talking about Ontario, have a bank on reserve, and many communities are forced to rely on informal high cost or predatory financial products and services. Um, so the barriers are few local banks, credit unions, alternative services, uh, costly uh, local retailers, uh, lack of ID, an issue with many people, uh, have to open accounts in person and travel costs can be prohibitive. Uh, we understand that some of this is changing, but um, it's still uh, difficult to uh, open a bank, a uh, bank account. Uh, poor internet uh, service makes online banking very hard, so they, uh, the services often on First Nations, uh, very slow um, um, internet service. So the opportunities are banks interested in serving growing indigenous market and related partnerships, fintech, may open up secure alternatives to in-person requirement to open an account, vouching and services to help people get ideas, IDs can reduce this barrier, Government, federal government expanding high-speed internet to more rural and re remote communities. <coughs> so that's a change there. So um, thank you very, very much for uh, this portion of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Liz. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, uh, just before I get started, um, I just want to remind people, if you have questions, please type them in to the little box, um, and then uh, we will be collecting them. And at the end, we're going to leave time to do questions and answers. So hopefully, we'll have time to uh, get back to most of your questions. If we don't, there's always an opportunity to follow up later after the webinar. So I'm going to talk about the opportunity uh, that workplaces present to build financial wellness um, for uh, Indigenous peoples. So um, 
Again, under Canada's National Financial Literacy Strategy, workplace financial uh, literacy and education have been identified as a key priority we really want to focus on under the next two years. Um, and employers themselves, I think, are really aware that financial stress is actually one of the key problems, that, the number one problem that many of their employees are facing, um, and that it affects uh, the well-being of their employees, but also the productivity in the workplace. So. Uh, employers are increasingly open to uh, ways that they can help their employees resolve financial problems and build their financial health, uh, which is very good news. Um, so uh, employers come in different shapes and sizes, so not all of these suggestions are things that every employer can do, but um, I think we should think of it more as a menu and employers will adopt what they find to be most appropriate for them or maybe build things over time. Um, the first thing is if an employer has an employee assistance plan, um, then building financial education and counseling into that uh, is an excellent way to make sure that there's a place that employees can go if they do have uh, financial troubles but, or even if they just want to build their financial understanding and knowledge uh, so they can manage their money more effectively. Um, the second thing that we know for many employers is an issue is um, employees uh, who run out of uh, money before they run out of month um, and uh, maybe have exhausted forms of credit that are available to them, sometimes require emergency loans. Um, if employers can maintain an emergency loan fund for their employees, this provides a much safer and less costly alternative than payday loans, which can often trigger a, a downward spiral of debt for people if they are, are having a hard time making ends meet. Um, and employers um, where employees have uneven work schedules or paychecks that fluctuate a lot um, particularly might want to pay attention to this because we know that kind of month-to-month -month income volatility is a major driver um, for payday loan use and having to borrow. Um, so an emergency loan fund can give everybody a safe way to, to smooth those income expense gaps uh, and to maintain financial health. Another thing that employers can do is organize an annual workplace tax clinic. If they have a workplace that everybody congregates at or a number of workplaces, um, this can really help low and modest income employees because so many government benefits are delivered through the tax system. And if employees aren't tax filing or need help tax filing, uh, this can make sure that they're getting the income that they're eligible for. Um, and uh, we'll talk at the end about some resources from the um, Canada Revenue Agency to support tax clinics. Uh, finally, and this is a little more challenging, but something that perhaps employers, um, once we have the tools developed, could look at down the road, is to offer benefit screening to employees to see if they're eligible for other income benefits they're not receiving. For instance, if you have employees with children, the Canada Child Benefit is a very important benefit that uh, can provide uh, as much as over $6,000 a year per child. Um, so it's really important that uh, employees who aren't getting this but have children who are eligible are connected to it. Um, we're currently piloting an online benefit screening tool that we hope once it's um, proven itself <laughs> that we can roll out more comprehensively and make available uh, to any partners that want to make use of it. Um, I should point out though that when you are screening for benefits, however, it's also important to be able to have, uh, to be able to refer uh, the people that you're screening to community supports to help them tax file or to apply for benefits if they need that assistance. Um, sometimes the problem isn't just information, people need help navigating these systems. Uh, turning to the next slide. So um, in financial empowerment, we like to think of certain things as golden moments <laughs> where if you make use of them, uh, you can really make a very large difference in people's financial lives. So onboarding a new employee is one of those moments. So if uh, you're working with employers or you are an employer, uh, one of the key things that you can do is ensure that every new employee actually has a bank account and if they don't, help them to open one. Um, setting up direct deposit uh, helps employees avoid costly check cashing fees. Um, if they're going to a check casher, uh, which um, uh, can be frequent, and check cashers can be formal ones, you know, the check casher on the sign outside, but it can be informal ones like local retailers, etc. But sometimes they charge for that. So there's a way to do direct deposit and save employees those costs. Um, that's, a, that's a very um, simple and productive way to help. 
another thing that you can do is uh, th through your payroll, if it's automated, is set up automatic savings for employees. Um, there's a lot of scientific evidence showing that if you set up a payroll to automatically have employees save a certain percentage of their payroll, uh, but allow them the chance to opt out, rather than not having it set up automatically and inviting employees to opt into a savings uh, program, uh, the opt-out uh, function will have a much higher success rate, uh, typically over 90%. So um, it's really important to set this up as the default um, and then to allow employees either to opt out completely if they don't feel it's appropriate or to uh, change the savings amount. Um, but it's a very powerful way to help put an employee on a path to future financial security. Um, if uh, large employers uh, may be able to do this, smaller ones will find it challenging, but matching employee savings at some level uh, can provide another powerful incentive. Uh, so it might be uh, $1 for every four or some percentage match. Um, uh, also, if families, uh, if an employee um, has a child 0 to 17 years of age, then um, telling them about the Registered Education Savings Plan and the Canada Learning Bond um, it can be uh, a really important moment. Um, the Canada Learning Bond will provide up to $2,000 of free federal government money uh, that gets put automatically into the child's RESP once it's opened uh, for families that are low income. Um, and as Simon mentioned earlier, there's a really uh, enormous amount of scientific evidence now that shows that children from low and modest income um, households that ha grow up with an education savings plan are far more likely to attend post-secondary education than children from similar backgrounds who don't, and they're much more likely to graduate successfully. And we know that post-secondary education um, is, uh, has been shown to dramatically improve lifetime earnings and is really a proven pathway out of poverty. So this is a very, very powerful intervention, and we'll talk again at the end about where you can find more information on that. Similarly, if uh, it's important to ask your employees if they have a child or a family member with a disability. And the reason for this is in Canada we have the Registered Disability Savings Plan. And like the Education Plan, this also has a disability bond uh, that's uh, worth a significant amount of money. This is free money the government will put in right away. You don't have to make any savings yourself to access it if you're a low-income family. And on top of that, there are generous savings incentives. Um, and in total, this can amount to as much as $90,000 in federal grants um, over the lifetime of the person with a disability. So again, this can be a very powerful way to build financial security for the next generation. Um, and finally, providing information on income benefits that are available to Indigenous Canadians and encouraging them to consider tax filing if they haven't done so uh, is a really important way to help people boost their incomes. Um, and the one caveat we'd say here is um, if somebody has a bad debt and they're worried about their bank account being garnished, then it's important to connect them to credit counseling or some other service to help them resolve their debt issue before they tax file. Um, otherwise, they risk um, having that money garnished. So, um, but otherwise, uh, this is generally um, just a very beneficial intervention if, uh, if you can do it. So that is the extent of um, uh, our suggestions for employers. Um, at the same time, uh, we're also working with AFOA Canada on how we can build, if we can move the next slide, please, how we can build uh, community financial empowerment services that can help uh, Indigenous individuals as well as their families and communities to build financial wellness. And uh, just to anchor this a little bit, um, when we talk about financial empowerment, we're really referring to four specific buckets or pillars of interventions that have a lot of evidence behind them that if they're done, um, if they're really tailored to the financial context and realities of specific groups and delivered in concert with other community supports, they can really measurably improve financial outcomes. So those uh, four pillars are first, financial education and one-on-one -on -one support, counseling or coaching. Uh, two, uh, helping connect people to their benefits and to tax file. Uh, three, connecting people to safe and affordable financial products and services. And these are all in the, um, I should say, in that uh, financial wellness framework diagram, the medicine wheel that Simon showed us earlier. 
And uh, the fourth one is connecting people to saving and asset building opportunities. And the fifth is consumer education and protection. So that's just to provide the context for um, the project that I'm going to describe now. So this is a collaboration between Prosper Canada and uh, AFOA Canada with support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation and TD Bank Group. Um, and really it's a project where we were aiming to build sustainable financial empowerment capacity in communities to help them build their financial wellness. And in particular we were working in, uh, we started out uh, targeting four Ontario First Nations communities um, and then one had to drop out to do turnover and personnel. Um, so uh, we're adding a fourth one uh, now this year. But um, And really what we were aiming to do there was three things. One was, first thing was financial education. So this was really building capacity in the community to deliver financial literacy workshops that would provide community members with the tools and knowledge they need to better manage their money. Uh, the second thing that we wanted to provide people with was access to one-on-one -on -one financial support. So this was really one-on-one -on -one coaching services that would help people to set and build action plans to achieve their financial goals. And thirdly, we wanted to connect people to opportunities to build their financial wellness, either help accessing income benefits through tax filing, uh, connecting people to banking services, and also to the opportunities to save that we talked about a moment ago, the Registered Education Savings Plan and the Registered Disability Savings Plan. So that was the plan. It was a three-year project. Uh, we're just starting on the third year now. Uh, but uh, because no plan survives the actual start of battle, if we can move to the next slide. Um, we've learned a lot in this process, uh, and uh, we've made adjustments to our project to, um, to better respond to where communities were at and their priorities. Um, so I would say that what we learned was that our initial approach, our plan, really exceeded the community capacity that was available to take on so many new things all at once. Um, and I think in retrospect, we understand that it's really important to start with something more modest uh, that really anchors around a community priority, um, work with the community to build the capacity on that, get it up and running, established, and then start to move on to add other interventions. Uh, I think we bit off probably more than any of us could chew at the beginning of this project. But um, so I'd say also the, the really where we um, met our Waterloo was around rolling out a full coaching model. Uh, and it was really challenging. Uh, we saw a lot of information, interest, or interest rather, and desire to be able to provide one-on-one -on -one financial uh, support for people, but uh, really understanding that for anybody to feel comfortable providing that kind of level of intensive support. They really need more time to engage with the financial content, more experience working with people around that content before they're ready to take on one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. Um, however, what communities did say was once they had the training uh, that they felt fine providing one-on-one -on -one financial information to people, so passing on the knowledge that they were gaining, uh, just not working with people on comprehensive financial plans and action plans. Um, so what people also uh, found very useful were focusing on the more limited access interventions. We're really targeting on a specific goal like setting up a bank account, getting somebody on direct deposit, um, opening an RESP, um, getting somebody tax filed. So we reorganized the project to really start with a financial education, get people trained up on that and delivering that in communities. Um, working with them on how to provide one-on-one -on -one support around things like uh, getting banked or opening an RESP, and then making sure, uh, then rolling out community supports to um, promote tax filing and connect people to their benefits. So that's now uh, more the shape of the project, and as I said, we're entering into our final year now. Uh, at the over the course of this year, we will be taking all the tools and materials that we've developed and sharing these in a systematic way with other First Nations communities, so stay tuned for more information. Uh, if you subscribe to our newsletter online, you'll hear about that, or if you visit our website. Um, but uh, we look forward to sharing this with more uh, communities, and we will be training uh, additional First Nations communities as well. to turn it back over to Simon to talk about principles to guide uh, financial empowerment work in communities and uh, effective 
practices that we've learned along the way. So um, we're going to talk about uh, principles and uh, effective uh, practice. Um, there's a nice picture of an um, underwater serpent that you just looked at. Um, so we're um, uh, both AFOA and uh, PROSPER um, take uh, the evidence base uh, very seriously and um, the five points that I'm about to cover um, come out of the um, um, evidence uh, for working with um, Indigenous people, uh, First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis in Canada. And um, the first point is partnerships, uh, working collaboratively. Uh, so I think uh, taking the time to develop trust and safety um, is a critical um, uh, first step. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about cultural safety. Um, so we need to provide education, support, and access that is culturally relevant and safe. Um, cultural safety uh, is a term uh, first used in uh, New Zealand by a Maori uh, nurse. And it basically what she was trying to get across was that relationships need to be not only one-on-one -on -one, but uh, on an equal level and um, and then there the the safe part um, is critical that um, uh, both partners understand uh, indigenous uh, culture uh, having a respectful uh, relationship um, build mutual respect trust and understanding and um, um, Prosper and AFOA have learned that it's a learning process, that we're, it's a two-way learning process uh, from the community. Um, we're learning about the community, but the community is also learning about us, and that, and that takes um, a little bit of time. The knowledge base, um, we, we call it two-eyed seeing approach, uh, is uh, used uh, in the health field, but we're applying it here. Uh, which uses both indigenous and Western knowledge to, in finding solutions. Um, it was a, uh, there was a um, uh, Mi'kmaq elder who first coined uh, the term. And in the Mi'kmaq language and Mi'kmaq culture, um, being able to uh, see things uh, from two perspectives is, is a gift. Um, and... Um, and respect it in, in their communities. So that's what we're using. We're using an indigenous lens as well as a Western lens in finding, um, in finding solutions uh, around financial wellness. Uh, supportive, support First Nations partners and community interests. Uh, there's a lot of talk uh, these days about uh, community engagement, community driven, bottom up approaches. And I think that's one of the things that we uh, have learned is that um, uh, the communities we're working with um, have their own needs and their own priorities. Um, for example, um, I, I was in one community and we were talking about the child tax benefit and all of a sudden uh, I think the light went on in the community that they were losing uh, 200 to 300,000 a year in uh, benefits and uh, that got, got them to action fairly quickly. So I think it's important to understand what the, not only what the community needs are, but also what the priorities are. So we're gonna go to the next uh, slide called uh, the healing path. Um, last uh, 10 years in Canada, we've um, heard a lot about the healing path uh, from uh, survivors of residential school uh, from communities, and this particular um, um, healing path uh, was developed by um, uh, one of my students, um, an MA student, uh, who was a Medewin um, uh, healer, and they start with um, any problem that we have as human beings uh, begins with talking. Uh, you can't uh, resolve issues or go on a healing path without beginning uh, 
the talking process. So the first um, uh, step is to, to talk. And Canadians are excellent at uh, the second step, listening and learning. So you begin with talking, but then um, from your perspective, you're listening to the other person. So not only are you listening, but you're learning. Uh, they're educating us. And it, then the shoe goes on the other foot. You're talking. The other person's listening. And they're listening and learning um, from you. So the, um, the third step is the healing path. And I think um, it's uh, important to understand, and probably many of you have this perspective, that the journey is as important as the outcome, that we're, we're all on some type of journey uh, with our uh, partners, uh, with the people that we work with. And so the healing path is really the path that we're on most of the time. And with First Nations communities, um, the, the ones that we've begun working with, we've gone through the talking process, we've gone through the listening and learning process, and when we actually go to deliver programs with them or collaborative, collaboratively with them, uh, we're talking about the healing path. And so that's why um, it takes so long to get to the delivery side because we have to go through this process uh, or protocol of talking and listening and learning. And uh, sometimes uh, it can take a, a year, two years, three years to go through this process. So uh, that's one of the things that we're learning as a result of the work that we're doing. So the healing path leads to being healed. And earlier I talked about having a balance between the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. So the, uh, being healed simply means finding that balance. Uh, it... it um, it's not necessarily an endpoint because things can um, uh, start going through the whole process over and over again. Um, so the um, uh, healing path, we're going to go to the next slide. We're going to talk about um, key learnings. And I, we've, uh, both Liz and I have um, covered some of these points, but th this is an excellent opportunity to um, um, uh, summarize. Uh, some of the major points. So uh, engaging communities and partners is critical process that just take, it takes time. Uh, partnership development, community engagement, planning are critical stages uh, that may take longer than uh, anticipated. And I think um, this is a learning uh, not only that we've learned, but uh, we've learned in many other areas uh, with working with Indigenous people. And it does take time to build that trust. It does take time to uh, work uh, collabor collaboratively or using cultural safety. Um, so it, it could take longer than a year. Uh, partners need time to develop knowledge and skills needed to deliver programs with confidence. Uh, it is important to start where people are at. We talked about the, uh, the needs-based approach. While some community staff have significant experience, others will have to build upon their own financial wellness and literacy understanding and the skills to share this knowledge with community members, for example, uh, workshop facilitation, program planning, are, are all opportunities to practice um, the key is to help build skills and confidence. So it, it takes time. Uh, the third point, uh, organizations leading programs will have their own learning curve. Uh, it takes time to build relationships with each community and to understand their unique needs, challenges, values, and contexts. When we talk about contexts, each community has their own unique history, as well as the services that they already uh, provided and exists in the communities. How these operate in the community and how they relate to new financial empowerment efforts. Um, in some communities, um, we may start with the um, some of our members, uh, AFOA members, who are working in the finance area or administration area. But it could be in health, it could be in education, it could be in social services, uh, it could be in maternal child health. So there, there's uh, 
these very point, various points and leadership in communities that we should be looking for. Community partners are experts in the needs of their community and best practices for programs in their community. So we, that's the learning part um, that both AFOA and Prosper Canada uh, go through. There's a, there is little excess capacity in communities to take major new initiatives unless they are properly resourced. Uh, what's interesting about First Nations, for example, is they uh, manage and deliver um, everything from health, education, social services, et cetera, in a community. Um, they have greater responsibility uh, and wider responsibility than any city in Canada. I really don't know how they do it, but um, they are also underfunded, if you uh, listen to the media, and under-resourced. So there's, um, they have a tremendous workload, but they have an interest in this area. So participating in the development of new services is a significant commitment for every community. But even more challenging, um, if no additional resources are provided to offset the extra demands, place on participating staff and community members. So we have to keep that uh, foremost in our mind. The final point, in communities with multiple challenges, um, these can often take priority. Uh, communities may express strong interest and need, but they need, but they are grappling with other priorities and challenges. These at time may take precedence uh, over less urgent needs. So. Um, I, you know, I think it's a, a it's a challenge. Uh, our job is to um, uh, work with these communities, uh, pro provide the information and the education and support um, that will keep uh, financial wellness a, a priority um, in their communities. And I think that uh, uh, both Prosper Canada and AFOA Canada are committed to um, uh, increase the um, capacity in these communities uh, to, in the end, achieve outcomes of um, not only wellness, but health, uh, education, and employment. So I will turn it over to Liz at this point. Miigwech. Thanks very much, Simon. Although I think I have to hand it back to you because the first resource we're going to talk about, uh, so this section is really about pointing you to some key resources where you can get more information and um, uh, access to uh, uh, materials and um, uh, sort of paper resources, etc. on some of the things we've talked about. Uh, and the first one, if you'll turn to the next slide, is AFOA Canada's own capacity building workshop. So back to you, Simon. You're right. Uh, if you're wondering what I look like, uh, go on to YouTube, and um, there are eight modules there. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I did the um, uh, retirement planning uh, workshop. Uh, in fact, this is uh, the our YouTube um, um, blockbuster. Uh, a lot of people go to it. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, a lot of people don't uh, know how they're going to retire. In fact. I think 50% of uh, Indigenous people over 65 are still w working, a, a lot of them for um, uh, good reason. Um, we don't have a word for retirement in our, um, in our Indigenous languages, <clears throat> but um, it's an excellent resource um, and AFOA uh, is proud to um, um, have this resource available uh, to people. There's also a a capacity development workshop that we provide along with it. Miigwech. So back to Liz. Great. Next slide, please. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, so uh, we've talked quite a bit about tax filing uh, and tax clinics. So the Canada Revenue Agency actually provides a variety of supports 
for Indigenous tax filing. Um, the chief one is the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program, and this is available throughout the country, not just in um, Indigenous communities, but it's a program to support training and mobilization of volunteers to support free community tax clinics. Um, there is a, a CVITP, that's our short name for it, Indigenous Peoples Coordinator. So if you're interested in organizing a tax clinic specifically for Indigenous people or on reserve, uh, you can reach out to the coordinator there. Um, there's also a 1-800 number if you want information for anybody about taxes, credits, benefits, your account. Um, and uh, there's a CVITP um, volunteer site on the Canada Revenue Agency site where uh, folks can register for the program or find out more about it. Um, and there's also specific information about tax benefits for Indigenous peoples um, and it's on the, at the URL that's indicated there. So, uh, and there are posters and materials available um, to promote tax clinics and some of these are available in different uh, Indigenous languages. So um, uh, folks can access those as well. Uh, the next uh, slide is um, is where you can go for information on opening an RESP if you're an Indigenous person or you're somebody supporting people in Indigenous communities. Um, I should point out that somebody just tested that URL and their site is down for some maintenance right now. Uh, but if you're eager to find out more, then we recommend that you go to smartsaver.org, S-M-A-R-T, S-A-V like Victor, E-R, Dot org, uh, and that will connect you to information that you need on the RESP and the Canada Learning Bond. Um, uh, moving to the next slide. Um, for anybody who's interested in learning more about registered disability savings plans, um, how to qualify, how to set them up, uh, the benefits, uh, we encourage you to go to PLAN's website, the PLAN Lifetime Advocacy Network. Um, and you can locate that at rdsp.com and they have the most comprehensive information around RDSPs and all the steps that you need to go through there, um, as well as uh, information specific to Indigenous people. Uh, and this is our fine website, um, <laughs> Prosper Canada. So we offer online and in-person training for financial educators and um, we're also starting financial training for coaches. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, please go to our website and there's contact information if you want to reach out to one of our staff to explore opportunities there. So, um, and there's also, um, I should say for anybody engaged in financial education, we also have under the resources tab at the top of the site um, over 100 different financial education resources uh, and they're available in over 10 languages, I believe. Um, so, and those are all free for downloading for anybody who's interested, so please help yourself. So, moving to the next slide. Um, we touched on this a tiny bit in Simon's comments around retirement planning, but this is a particularly challenging area for many people, um, not just Indigenous or low income. Um, but um, uh, there is a very helpful guide for anybody working in uh, any low-income community or with low-income clients uh, on planning for retirement on a low, uh, if you have a low income. This was developed by John Stapleton, who is a former longtime Ontario public servant uh, in the income security area. He's a, a very well-known expert in this area, and he worked with other key experts around retirement planning. Uh, to develop a guide specifically on how low-income people can maximize uh, their financial uh, wellness um, through making the right choices at the right time around their retirement income. So uh, that is um, available for free. Just go to the website and download it. Um, and if you're in Toronto, John regularly does public library appearances where he gives talks on this. Um, and I'm sure you can get information on those appearances at his website as well. But a uh, very effective guide. So uh, with that, I'll close, and I'd also like to thank Simon. Uh, for those of you who have been appreciating the beautiful artwork throughout this presentation, uh, Simon is also a very talented artist, uh, and so uh, he makes all of our presentations look better. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you again to Simon and Liz for the overview today on Indigenous financial wellness. 
And thank you to everyone who's been submitting questions. We've received a number of questions so far, so uh, if you still have some, you can have them coming in and we'll do our, our best to address them from there. Uh, so in some cases, um, I may assist with some of the questions and I'm also going to direct some questions to Liz and Simon from there. So we actually had a number of questions around the theme of uh, wanting to hear more about the communities that we're working with and as well um, how we did some of that work. Um, so I will start to kick that off and then as well uh, hand over to Simon to speak a little bit about um, approaches for working with First Nations communities. Uh, so specifically in our financial wellness project uh, within the province of Ontario, we work most closely with Whitefish River First Nation, uh, which is uh, on a, just close to Manitoulin Island or Sudbury for those of you who are outside of Ontario. And uh, our work, and this will kind of show a bit about the project model and how we started out. So our first was understanding uh, and working with the community to understand what are some of the financial needs and challenges that are faced by the community. Um, what are some of the access challenges that are faced there in terms of, so in this case, a local bank would be 40 minutes away from the community. Uh, what are some of the existing services that are provided by the community? So we work closely with the staff in uh, housing departments, uh, social assistance, uh, youth departments, uh, health department to look at um, what types of services do they already offer community members, what types of challenges are they seen within the uh, people's daily lives, and what are some opportunities that they see for um, focusing this work. So um, one of the key things that we think is important to highlight is that the uh, the large diversity within communities, within Ontario and within Canada in terms of what those challenges might be, but also what are some of the opportunities that might work. So Whitefish River in particular identified that providing financial education for youth was one of the key priorities that they saw. And so as a result of the training that AFOA Canada and Prosper Canada, so using a train the trainer model, they then uh, used that basis in financial literacy um, to design and deliver a four series workshops to communities uh, youth uh, who are looking at post-secondary education. So really looking at uh, an effective, taking that effective model of here's some financial education and here's a life transition that uh, youth could uh, be doing and how to assist them to make sure that they had the information and prepared so that they were fully supported uh, when they would leave the community and, and coming back. Uh, the other initiative that Whitefish River took on is uh, this year they offered their first a community volunteer income tax program and so that was through accessing uh, d identified as a need and accessing training from the CRA to be able to offer free tax filing services for uh, community members and so a first time of doing that work. Um, we've also worked with Moose Creek First Nation on the James Bay uh, training staff as well as in that case uh, community volunteers to be able to offer financial education workshops for community members and um, I think in terms of the other question, I think, which is an excellent question, was uh, talking more specifically about the, um, some of the challenges for communities that may not have been ready to do this work or where we've encountered challenges. And I think Simon and Liz spoke to some of the more general ones, but often that might be where we've seen changes in staff roles um, over the course of the project. Um, and I'd say that would actually be the primary one. Uh, in terms of looking at that program framework, uh, as Liz said, our grand ambitions of looking at the holistic suite of services is that we really, I think, set out to do more than uh, there. So we're uh, working back to identify how can we build a solid foundation for future work beyond the uh, extent of the three-year engagement that we have. So Simon, I'm going to turn uh, this question to you. So someone was interested hearing more about uh, train the trainer model. So I was wondering if you could speak to uh, effective training practices for train the trainer. Okay. Um, well, I think um, I, I'm going to make a couple of points. Um, I, you know, I think the uh, the work that Natasha did with the communities in developing a relationship. Um, was critical uh, to getting the project started. So um, it, oftentimes you're doing it over the phone, so 
Um, Natasha's done, an, I think, an excellent job developing those relationships um, over the phone, but in person is uh, is uh, critical. And um, go to go to uh, Natasha's question. Um, I think um, that the I, I'm I'm thinking about a, a, one of my students was a, um, a social worker in. And what, what she found was uh, that you have to establish a relationship uh, with the people that you're working with um, that um, is at a person-to-person -person, uh, basis uh, to develop strong relationships. And then when we um, actually did the uh, uh, training in Whitefish as well as um, uh, the Moose Cree, um, we we established that ki that kind of person to person uh, relationship. We used humor a lot. Um, we used uh, anecdotes that were uh, personal and uh, from our from our own experience. And so the communities were able to better understand the um, um, the, the material that we were uh, providing uh, to them. I think the other aspect is it's got to be uh, culturally relevant. Um, some of the la language that we use isn't the language that's um, uh, used in the community. For example, uh, things like money. Um, some communities will use uh, terminology that's uh, relevant to them. Uh, like uh, I know in, in a lot of the uh, Iroquois communities, they talk about a wista, which is, uh, which is money. So th there's a little bit of a learning process that we all go through in I think understanding uh, local culture, but also trying to make the material that we're using uh, relevant uh, to the communities. I, and I think one of the uh, points that uh, we, we're looking at uh, case studies, and some of the communities are, are concerned about uh, young men who, um, who are staying at home, and um, um, uh, their concern is how do we get these young men out of the basement and into a job, and so, uh, you know, I think we have to pay attention to uh, a lot of these points um, that are made locally, and then you, we have advocates at the local level. I think their voices uh, need to be need to be heard. Uh, we when we were up in uh, Moose Cree, we videotaped um, one of the people that we were training who had wonderful messages at the local level that were relevant. So I'll turn it back to Natasha. Great. I might be turning it right back to you, Simon. Um, but <laughs> beforehand, um, I also wanted to say that um, as a non-Indigenous organization, the key to our work and our learning has had been the opportunity to work with AFOA Canada as well as uh, the communities. And so um, part of this work is um, coming with uh, sharing what we know, but also grounding it. How do communities uh, understand and define financial wellness? So. Um, we didn't come with a pre-existing material, but um, the resources that both organizations started with, and, and our hope is through this work is to be able to um, have uh, more tailored resources for communities um, and coming from some of the, the learnings and materials that are there. But uh, a question, and Simon, I'll see if, uh, I don't have you in the room, so um, I'll see if this is one you can answer, otherwise I can um, share some thoughts from anecdotes. So. Um, have you found anything about challenges of debt uh, in the communities in the project? So this is a question on, um, uh, we didn't talk about debt today. Uh, was debt w one of the challenges that we're seeing? Well, I think we, you know, yeah, at the local level, uh, um, we, we didn't really talk about it specifically. I think, I think uh, the, the debt is there. I think uh, in a lot of the... Um, um, teaching that we were doing, uh, debt was uh, an underlying issue. Um, I, I think particularly we were, we were talking about um, people going not to banks but to other lenders and uh, they, they were really talking about, um, you know, the slippery slope that uh, some of the community members get into, uh, uh, borrowing money at a high rate um, or even uh, these payday uh, uh, 
um, businesses. Uh, I, so I think there was a lot of concern um, that people are getting into debt uh, when they're unbanked uh, using these uh, predatory um, uh, lending services um, that are out there. So I think that was a big, that, that seemed to me was sort of the biggest issue that um, uh, we're, we're, facing, uh, we're facing people. Thank you for adding that, Simon. So while debt um, wasn't the primary focus, it is one of the topics that was covered in uh, financial education training that community members received. Um, and I think as Simon was speaking about, often because of um, some communities where there may uh, be barriers to banking, there's also uh, historically a lot of access to credit barriers within communities. So um, where communities um, may have not been approved for uh, credit in the past and not have had the ability for uh, secured credit. Um, some of the challenges that we have seen, and this is also within uh, urban communities as well, is where there's a gap in financial services. You have other lenders that come in. So um, one community in particular shared the rise of high cost um, auto loans as being an issue within the community. And I know um, FCAC, the Financial Community. Consumer Agency of Canada last mm -hmm. year put out a market trend report specifically on uh, predatory auto financing, if anyone is interested in that resource um, as well. Um, sometimes uh, with uh, banking accounts as well, uh, community members might be doing a lot of their banking over the phone, so receiving um, offers or calls from financial institutions for uh, lines of credit, um, but may not necessarily have had the opportunity to be introduced to that uh, line of credit and how that might work. Um, so we definitely see that um, there are uh, some debt challenges that can be faced by community members. And I think for the community members that are focused on youth financial literacy, they're particularly interested in sharing information uh, for their youth as they make transitions where they might be uh, leaving the community for work or school or uh, being offered uh, credit products. Uh, the question also was related to the project, this next one. How did you provide uh, bank accounts for those on First Nations? Um, so I'll just speak quickly to that. Within the project, we actually um, did not end up focusing on banking directly as one of the access programs. So uh, in our last two years, we've really been more orienting around opportunities for uh, access to benefits and income tax filing. Um, but we are interested in uh, better understanding opportunities for bridging that access challenge. Um, and so we also know that uh, increasingly a uh, number of different financial institutions are, are starting to offer uh, mobile account offering services in partnerships, so uh, working with communities that are interested to uh, bridge that gap for membership so that they don't have to travel to a financial institution to open a bank account, but where they'll come and do mobile account setups. Uh, there are also initiatives that uh, organizations are looking at in terms of uh, facilitating access to the registered education savings plan uh, combined with basic banking accounts, so coming to communities. So while we haven't done that work directly within the project, uh, there's lots of examples that we can draw on in the work in the United States and Indigenous communities as well as in Australia. Liz, I have a question for you. This is uh, going back to the slides on employers, so mm -hmm. when you reference the emergency fund that employers could set up, are those funded by employers or is there any government support for this? Um, sadly, it would be up to employers themselves to set that up. Um, but, um, and I don't, you know, we haven't done a ton of work on this, so I'm speculating, but I don't think these need to be huge funds. But even for small loans, they'd really be for small dollar loans, like under $500. So. Um, but uh, it would be up to the employer to provide the funds for that. Thanks. And actually, I'll turn to you for a question as well on banks on First Nations. So mm -hmm. uh, this is coming back to the slide that uh, four mm -hmm. First Nations had a bank on reserve. Um, mm -hmm. Does that mean that the banks are owned by the First Nation? Yeah. Thanks. And uh, I might turn it over to Simon to chime in after on this. Um, so we um, drew that information from a report that was prepared for the National Task Force on Financial Literacy uh, quite a while ago. It was back in 2011. Um, it, was performed, it was a, a report on uh, Indigenous financial literacy, and this was uh, one of the 
uh, pieces of information that was quoted in the report from their research. Um, and we supplemented that with a quick scan in Ontario to see where uh, uh, whether any banks or credit unions um, were located on First Nations reserves in Ontario. So that's where that number came from. Um, uh, none of them were Indigenous banks, if I recall correctly. Um, but I would have to go back to check to be entirely certain. So if anybody wants more information on that, please email us and we can connect you to the sources uh, and you can look at the data. Thank you. And Simon, did you want to add anything on uh, access to bank accounts? Sure. Um, well, I, I happen to know at Six Nations there's a, a Bank of Montreal. Um, so to uh, most of the major banks um, have banks um, in uh, First Nations communities. Uh, there's a there's also the First Nations uh, Bank of Canada uh, that's also located in First Nations. But um, like any other banks, they're in there for business, and you need a um, sort of a sig sig significant number of people to be uh, to make the bank uh, viable. So there there aren't many banks on First Nations, except in those communities where you have a large population or a large regional population that makes it uh, financially viable. So the, the, to, to say that uh, they are located on reserve, but um, when, when it's uh, financially viable. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, my friend has just uh, chimed in, actually. We have some information from one of our colleagues. So many banks that operate, uh, that are uh, Peace Hills Trust, uh, First Nations Bank of Canada, um, that they have a branch on Walpole Island, which only has four people on reserve. So, sorry, 400. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for my colleague for helping me add some numbers there. Um, so I have a few more questions in front of me um, that I think we'd like to be able to get to. And this one I might turn to you, Simon. So um, this is uh, asking about, can you, what advice can you provide for uh, working with uh, Indigenous people in an urban setting? So um, I'm going to guess maybe that this is a, a non-Indigenous organization uh, that serves a member of uh, a city or um, community more broadly. So what advice can you provide for um, working effectively with Indigenous people in the urban context? So, um, what, what I would advise is, well, first of all, establish a relationship and often phoning uh, the executive director or the uh, CEO of, uh, you could start with friendship centers, but I think in major cities there's over 50 um, um, uh, Indigenous related services in most cities, but there's a lot of friendship centers. I would I would start I would start there, develop a relationship. Um, I know, like we've said, uh, a lot, oftentimes these are very uh, busy organizations. Um, so I think finding a way to uh, uh, get yourself known, um, you know, going to powwows sounds kind of corny, uh, or their events and getting to know people. Uh, in the organization is is a good way to um, start developing a relationship. So, I that's what I would do is I would um, I would approach people, um, uh, get yourself known, and develop a relationship that way. Great. Turn it over. Thank you, Simon. I think that's a great starting point for organizations is to. Um, look at what connections you do have to community and how you can um, better understand uh, the needs and priorities and have the opportunity to learn. So um, depending on the city that you might be in, I know within Toronto, as Simon mentioned, the Friendship Centre Network, which is across the country, um, but there's uh, many opportunities, particularly as many of you on the call may know that uh, June is uh, National Abor Aboriginal History Month, so there's a number of uh, events and uh, learning opportunities for people to connect with, um, but looking at understanding um, what work is already happening um, and uh, working with organizations and partners um, before starting to do work on one's own, I think is also key. And Mm 
yeah, the fintech. Um, uh, this is Liz. Uh, I know that somebody had asked what fintech was, so I'm sorry we used that term without clarifying. Um, we forget that everybody doesn't live in our world, um, so it's an occupational hazard. So fintech is really the application of technology to delivering financial solutions um, on the product or service side. Uh, so uh, a great example of a fintech um, thing might be an app that helps people to save um, uh, through rounding up transactions, et cetera, and depositing the rounded up amount into your savings account automatically, something like that. But there's a whole kind of um, massive explosion of fintech solutions that are coming onto the market right now, and it's really seen as a major um, disrupting force in some senses of traditional banking. Um, in some ways, they're challenging the way that financial products and services are delivered to uh, customers and consumers. Um, and the banks are starting to engage with the fintech community. Sometimes they're partnering with fintech, sometimes they're investing in them, and sometimes they're buying them and integrating those new products and services into their own offering to their consumers. So, um, But what it means is there are more options for people to access products and services online. And for, I think, um, tools that help uh, people to more actively manage their money um, and that um, in the way that um, we see apps being used in healthcare now to prompt uh, good health behavior, we're starting to see the development of similar types of fintech solutions that help prompt us to adopt financial behaviors that will improve our financial health and uh, and also some that help to break down barriers to financial inclusion. So it's a pretty exciting landscape. Um, that does offer up more opportunities, I think, particularly for people who are living in rural and remote communities where direct access to bricks and mortar banks are not uh, probably something that's going to happen in the near term or even ever in some communities. So we really do need to find solutions that connect people to good products and services that meet their needs. So FinTech, I think, is part of that landscape of solutions that are starting to emerge. And we had one more question on uh, urban uh, organizations. So this question was asking whether or not we had any experience uh, working with uh, urban indigenous organizations. So um, from that perspective, uh, not in the context of this project, although um, Simon did uh, mention his work with the Adawa Friendship Center and uh, working with, in partnership with them to bring a community volunteer income tax clinic this evening, or sorry, this year. Um, and Prosper Canada more broadly, um, and I know that AFOA more broadly, pros uh, has partnerships and experience working with um, communities um, in urban and non-urban contexts. Um, and that has been in the past through providing our financial literacy education training. Uh, we've also worked with um, previously NAMI Res, which is in the City of Toronto a Native Men's Residency, um, where we provided their staff with financial education training and they also worked on a, a match savings program at that time to help uh, residents to be able to save for first and last month's rent. Um, we also know there are a number of organizations um, outside of both of ours that are doing this work uh, in urban context. Um, so for example, our partner uh, Seed Winnipeg has been providing uh, financial empowerment services to uh, the city of Winnipeg and working uh, very closely with uh, uh, serving Indigenous community there. Um, and previously through Prosper Canada's TD grant fund, um, we've uh, helped to fund a number of projects uh, led by uh, urban and uh, community organizations uh, in First Nations uh, and Indigenous and Métis serving communities. And so on our Prosper Canada resource page, we also have a few uh, insights from the financial literacy efforts from the TD Financial Literacy Grant Fund. Um, so while we didn't get into that in detail today, mm -hmm. there's some resources there. And Simon, this is one, um, I don't have the info uh, in front of me, but I'm not sure if you can speak to this. Uh, so this is one, our final question we'll look at. Uh, so when we say that income is higher in urban, is that an after-tax basis? And if so, what is the magnitude? Um, so do you have any more information we could share today on the webinar on the difference of income, typically? Uh, sure. And um, I, I wanted to make a point, too, about... Uh, the work at uh, Adawa, the Friendship Center here in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
um, I'm a volunteer there. I've been a volunteer for uh, about 20 years. Um, but by them knowing who I am, uh, it was a lot easier for me to uh, phone the executive director, um, who's a very busy person, and suggest that we do the clinic. And when I went, went actually in, I met with their, um, their finance person, and she said, oh, I've been wanting to do, the, do this for five years, you know. And so they just didn't have the, um, the uh, capacity to do the organizing. But because I was volunteering there, it enabled this thing to happen very quickly because they wanted to do it, but they didn't have the time to do it. Um, so I think when we look at income, uh, income on reserve is, um, is generally lower than, than off reserve. Um, the, uh, there's not a lot of, not many employers on reserve, uh, uh, jobs on reserve, for example, in my community, which is an hour and a half uh, north of here, uh, if people uh, want to work, they often are, uh, a lot of our community members live here in Ottawa because uh, incomes are higher. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is, but um, we know that um, um, the number of people that are on low income are quite high. I think it's like 75%. Um, low income uh, on reserve and in the city it, it's a lot less. It's just simply economics that uh, there's more jobs, higher incomes uh, in the cities. Um, but having said that, in some communities, um, uh, uh, some First Nations, uh, um, I, I know a couple for example where they've um, uh, started uh, businesses and uh, incomes have increased. There's a, um, a community in Saskatchewan just outside of Saskatoon that uh, in 1990s the uh, uh, unemployment rate was uh, like 85% and 95% um, of the students were not graduating from high school. But in the last um, 25 years they've increased the number of jobs um, and businesses on the reserve and it's completely flipped where 95 percent of the students are graduating from high school because they can get jobs on the reserve 95 percent of the uh, first nations um, members are have jobs and in fact they're they're um, a, a lot of the uh, new employees are coming from off reserve so it can turn around um, but um, we need we need more of that across Canada. Not sure if that answers your question. No, that's very helpful, Simon. And then um, for the question, any questions we weren't able to answer, we do encourage you to follow up with us and we'll be able to share more details from there. Um, so I wanted to do, um, as we're coming towards the end of our webinar, again, a, a very special thank you to Simon and Ottawa for joining us on the line and sharing um, learnings and insights um, with us and as well as Liz said, the, the beautiful artwork that we have. Um, and a thank you to Liz and the team at Prosper Canada for um, bringing this webinar together today. And thank you for everyone who has joined us uh, in this uh, conversation. Um, and as we said, we're, uh, there's a number of uh, work happening in this area in communities and in organizations. So we're uh, hoping to be part of uh, a conversation and understanding um, how to support this work going forward. Um, as we said earlier, everyone registered for the webinar will receive an email from us in the next few days with the slides and a recording. Um, if you're not already a part of the Prosper Canada mailing list, we encourage you to sign up on our website. Um, and we have two exciting webinars coming up this summer I just wanted to plug very briefly. Uh, so the next one coming up on July 7th is Insights to Impact. So what behavioral science can tell us about building financial well-being? And that's led by two researchers from a really uh, exciting organization in the U.S., Ideas 42. So, um, you know, learning financial information is one thing, but what role does our behavior um, play and what we do with that information? And then how can that help us to design better programs and services? So we're uh, excited about that session. And then Liz is going to come back with a, uh, for a webinar on August 23rd on income volatility in Canada, 
why it matters and what to do about it. Um, and so that's going to look at uh, changes in income, as uh, we, you may be seeing this in uh, your cities and your communities and um, how that affects uh, overall financial well-being and wellness. So again, uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us on the phone. Thank you and goodbye, Simon. <laughs> Have a good day.